Uh, let's move then to this story. Silent prayer faces being banned outside abortion clinics under a new law to be introduced at the end of next month. The government is enacting new legislation from the end of October that would bar protests, including silent prayer, within a buffer zone of 150 metres of a clinic or a hospital providing abortion services. Now, you may remember a Christian charity volunteer, Isabel Vaughan Spruce, has received £13,000 payout and an apology from the police after she claimed her arrest for praying silently outside an abortion clinic was unjust uh, and breached her human rights. Uh, so she got some money back out of that. Uh, Labour have ditched draft guidance by the last Conservative government that told police silent prayer should be allowed inside the new safe access zones. So this rest really, I mean, silent prayer is a very difficult one, I, one would assume, to prove. Uh, let's speak to a couple of voices on this. In a moment, Anne Faraday, who is uh, National Director, who is uh, Chief Executive of the British Pregnancy Service. Uh, but first, uh, let's speak with Stephen Green, National Director of Christian Voice. Stephen, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. No, can you hear us okay, Stephen? I can hear you okay, Ian. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just. There's a bit of a delay going on there, but I think we'll, we'll muddle through and see how, see how we go. I mean, just give us your reaction, firstly, to the... Uh, I mean, your, your view on people protesting in these settings in the first place. Well, I, I've been already convicted of uh, standing with a Bible verse outside the Murray Stokes abortion facility in mm -hmm. Ealing. Murray Stokes, of course, is uh, British Pregnancy Advisory Service's main competitor in the UK in the abortion market. Uh, so I had Psalm 139, verse 13, which says, uh, thou hast, um, thou hast uh, possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. It's one verse out of a, a psalm about God's omniscience and omnipresence in our lives, that wherever I am, God is with me. Okay. Uh, so I was convicted of that, and my appeal is to be heard in uh, Isleworth uh, Crown Court, uh, of, of, strangely enough, on the 30th and the 31st of October. And the 31st of October is when this uh, uh, nationwide ban on mm. any kind of witness okay. against uh, abortion or do anything... Uh, about that is due to come into force. Now, obviously, we can't talk uh, too much about your own case because there are still ongoing legal issues, and I get that, but you've outlined where you're at. Um, do you understand, though, how um, offensive it can be for a, a woman walking into a clinic, you mentioned a very famous one there, uh, to see somebody outside waving a Bible telling them they're about to go to hell? Well, I mean, I wasn't doing that. I was simply standing there and... Uh, and trying to minister the gospel, but of course the, uh, the Murray Stokes employees came out and, uh, and obstructed that. Um, you know, I mean, if, if you're running a shop, I mean, come on, you don't want people outside it anyway, so I understand where they're coming from, but nevertheless, they didn't need to do that. Um, I was just just preaching the word anyway. I wasn't telling anybody to get to go to hell, but uh, it, it's a strange, uh, we're in a strange situation where local authorities and the government are protecting private companies making money out of out of abortion uh, out of ending human life uh, that's a, it's a, a dangerous a dangerous road we have gone down and to prohibit the free expression of religion i mean silent prayer the, the I, that idea is ludicrous uh, and to pro prohibit somebody who's there with, with with the bible and display a bible verse uh, is going us going back to the 17th century when the, the five mile acts when certain expressions of religious uh, um, um, outreach were were prohibited by that at that time by the by the overweening Anglican Church uh, today it's secularism which cannot tolerate any dissent so you know we, we are in a strange place today is it not though I mean the way you defined just a second ago Stephen uh, what is going on here uh, you know essentially the state who are um, sanctioning the the end of life of children it is a many would say it's, that's a very insensitive way to define this it's a, a hyperbolic way of defining what is happening here it takes into it doesn't take into account the circumstances the reasons women will be there and most women going through that process will not be cavalier about this they will be doing something that has been incre an incredible emotional journey incredibly challenging to them their mental health and those around them there could be multiple circumstances as to why they are there 
the last thing they need is somebody who doesn't understand any of that. And if you're waving a Bible, even if you're not saying it out loud, it's quite clear what you're thinking. And you're compounding an already difficult situation for those women by being there. Ian, this all comes down to what is that in a mother's womb? If that is just a, a clump of cells, uh, as Amphoradi would probably um, su suggest, uh, th then of course you just sort of rip it out. But if that is a living, growing human being, as the psalmist contends, then uh, th then the argument is now rather different. I mean, I would like to ask uh, um, Amphoradi, what was she when she was in her mother's womb? What part of her mother's body was she? Because if this is just health care, as we're told, I mean, what other uh, aspect of, of health care uh, results in, in, in all this, this emotional trauma? I, I can't think of one. I'm contending it's not actually health care. It's a, it's a money-making business depending on the ending of human life. Would your contention be, I'm bound to ask on the back of that, the, this, uh, your definition of a human life is from conception? It has to be. It has to be because that is the moment when the, the Lord Almighty decided that you were a man and 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 Rady was a woman. But that that is the point when all all of your characteristics were cemented at that point of conception, and from then on, all you did was grow. And there could be no exception to somebody wanting or needing to terminate that process. If there was an ectopic pregnancy, which was going to kill the mother, then you would have to end the. Okay. Uh, the, the, so the, the, the obvious examples I'm, I'm, to preserve the mother. All right. The obvious examples, I'm sure you're ready for these questions, Stephen, would be somebody who's raped, somebody whose child is likely to have multiple uh, disabilities and challenges and, you know, beyond anything that, that, that could be saved after birth by, uh, by medics. Uh, they would be the two areas that people would throw at you and say, well, what about those circumstances? Well, in the case in the case of rape, if you kill the unborn child, you're making two victims out of one. So a woman, who's been, a woman who's been a raped should be should be forced to continue to go ahead with that pregnancy. I don't think abortion should be available in the case of rape because that makes another victim that destroys a human life, mm. irrespective of the sins of the father. In, in that case, to do with uh, disability, we build ramps for the disabled everywhere, and we, you know, we're all uh, uh, we're keen to have disabled people. Yeah, but I'm not talking about somebody with a dodgy uh, leg. I'm talking about somebody whose difficulties are so insurmountable that it will it no, would be it, cruel it, to continue medically, um, ethically, uh, through years of research into this area and uh, and the, the the amazing medical capabilities that that we have uh, that can be established at a, at a, a, a often a very early stage of pregnancy that this is not a child that is likely, possibly it won't go full term anyway, but even if the, the, the baby did, that the life will be so miserable and, and challenging and possibly uncomfortable and painful that a decision to terminate that pregnancy is the kinder, more advanced thing to do. Can yeah, you not get your head around that at case, all, Stephen? It, it is said hard cases make bad law. And, and what you do is exactly the same as euthanasia in Canada and and in the Netherlands. You, you bring in, in that law, and all of a sudden, you're aborting people because they have a hair lip. Listen, Stephen, thank you. Stephen Green, National Director of Christian Voice. If you want to respond to him, 0344 499 at 1000. Let's speak to Anne Faraday, author of The Moral Case for Abortion. It's an area uh, you are very familiar with through your, your, your own work, um, Anne. I mean, there was quite a lot to dissect from what Stephen said there. I mean, ultimately, this debate was really about the right to protest, but he's gone down the other path. I, I know it inevitably can go in that direction, but I don't think there's any um, politician or clinician in the land that has ever advocated that a hair lip is a reason to abort a child. Just on that point. I mean, just on that point, um, I think that what the whole discussion on abortion really comes down to is who makes the decision. And I think this is one of the, the things that, that ties together the reasons why women um, need access to abortion services and the problem of people like Stephen standing outside doing anything, really. Mm. And that's that nobody has an abortion because they are pro-choice 
or because they think that abortion should be provided. It's not like um, the right to vote where you might go and vote because you want to demonstrate that you're involving yourself in democracy. Generally, um, women who have abortions do so often thinking that they would never, ever do that in their entire life. And it's just that when they find that they are pregnant for one reason or another, it is just seems intolerable for them to continue the pregnancy. So when a woman goes to a clinic, she's not going there to have a political debate or have a discussion. She's going to access legal services. And I think that that's the point that when I was running British Pregnancy Advisory Service, I would always make to these people, if you want to debate abortion, debate the politicians, come and debate me, but you leave the women alone because they are accessing a different kind of service. That, that, yeah, and I think most people w w would echo that. I, I guess on the point of silent prayer, does that look, you know, I made the point to Stephen Green then, if you're outside waving a Bible, even if nobody can understand what the specific psalm you are quoting is, I think anyone walking into the Mary Stokes clinic and seeing that knows exactly what that person is saying. Yeah. They're saying what you're about to do is murder, what you're about to do is against God and you will be damned for your action. Everybody, it's very visual. If, however, somebody is standing, I don't know, 100 yards away with their head bowed saying a silent prayer, is that different? Because many people would say, well, that's a, a dignified way to... to, to allow your views to be expressed to your God? You know, it. I find it really difficult because, frankly, um, I'm a free speech absolutist. I don't think anybody should be banned from saying anything. And I want to bend the stick in favour of tolerating protest as much as possible. Um, but I think there's come a point now with these protests where... We kind of have to understand it in a bit of a different way. And there is something that is very performative. There's something that about them, I believe, that is constructed to, um, to provoke exactly the, the, the claim that they are being treated unreasonably. And i tell you why I think that is. And that is because when um, I first started doing this job, um, uh, there were nuns, a couple of nuns who would turn up to our clinic in Leamington Spa every week. And they would just be there by the side of a long drive that came into the clinic. And in fact, the staff would take them out, cups of tea, and let them use the lavatory and so on, because um, they were just there having a presence. They weren't in any way interfering with people coming into the clinic. When the, cl when the demonstrations or protests, even the silent prayer started more recently, we really tried to talk with Stephen and his colleagues and say, just do this anywhere you want. Just go the, down there. In fact, we were trying to negotiate 50 yards away from the clinic entrance because we just felt that women who were coming into the clinic were telling us that with all of the stuff about the um and the anti-abortion activity more generally this made them feel very upset and uncomfortable and we had a duty of care to be absolutely honest in some ways i wish they'd just been allowed to carry on saying their prayers because i think they would have got bored with it very quickly that's an interesting it, point it's a performance yeah i don't think that he's there deliberately trying to commune with god He's there to make a point to people going into the clinic. Otherwise, why do it there? That's a fair point. And listen, we, we stopped there for time, but we could talk longer. Thank you, Anne Faridi, uh, author of The Moral Case for Abortion, former chief exec of the British Pregnancy Service. Thank you to them. I'm going to